Um, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the webinar. Um, Kane Warriors, then. Um, Alex Wheatle, um, you could fill in the audience about what is Kane Warriors and what is uh, the story and how it came to you. And okay. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, how it came to me, it's a very good question. I was um, reunited with my mother, and uh, this is after many years. And uh, when we got together, she was talking about her childhood growing up in Jamaica, specifically in Richmond, St. Mary, um, which is near the North Coast. Now, my mother, when she was a young girl growing up in the, um, the late 30s, early 1940s, she said that the elders would sometimes come around at harvest time and they'd talk about the legend of Chief Taki walking this very land. And apparently, um, on further research, I'd learned that um, indeed Chief Taki, um, his plantation, the Frontier Plantation and the nearby Trinity Plantation was the very lands of where my mother was raised. And I never heard of Chief Taki before. Um, I thought I know I knew many Jamaican heroes, but not so Chief Taki. And so once I dived into that history and learned of the Easter Revolt in 1760 that was led by Chief Taki, I felt, oh my goodness, I really have to um, write this tale. It's something that um, that it should be more should be more available in schools and history and universities and colleges, because as I see it. Um, Chief Taki and what he tried to achieve is just as important as what happened with Troy, what happened with um, all these great heroes like Achilles and so on. So I really wanted to uh, present this to a young audience um, because obviously I'm a published writer, but um, sometimes stories like that get lost in time because sometimes they say stories are only told by the conquerors. And so it's really important to me. It felt like I was um, writing family history, if you like. I felt connected to the characters. I felt connected to the, um, the subject matter. And in a way, I've come full circle because I remember um, when I was serving time following the Bricks and Uprising of 1981, my cellmate offered me a book, The Black Jacobins by the great C.L.R. James. And that time, Hold the tale of the um, Haitian Revolution of 1791. So, um, in a way, I've come full circle, and I'm so so pleased that State of Emergency have agreed to um, take this story forward and interpret this story in dance form, which I love, by the way. And so, that is my involvement. I'm very proud of it. I'm very proud to be part of this project. Yeah, Alex. Sorry, I'm I, I'm back. Um, internet died. Um, um, My turn. <laughs> um, how does this story, do you feel, lend itself to a dance theatre production? Because, again, in my research, uh, especially in Jamaica, um, and indeed West Africa, where most Jamaicans, um, that's, where they descend, that's where their ancestors are, um, stories were told in dance. And indeed, when they um, when they were captured and came to the Caribbean, it wasn't they, they didn't just learn English immediately. They still spoke in their mother tongue many of the time, and um, they tried to communicate with, with each other by drum and by um, movement and by dance as well. And so this is why I felt that it was uh, necessary to tell this story in dance form, and it's dynamic and from what I saw last Friday at the performance at Bedford University. It was expressive, it was emotional, and I could feel every, almost every heartbeat, I could feel the pain of the lead characters. And for me, it's a perfect form to tell this story. Michael, how did you get involved? Uh, I got involved with um, King Warriors from uh, quite a long time ago, uh, when Steve and Deborah invited me to uh, be part of a project which was earlier and then we did some workshops leading them towards the performance and then after that we actually then did the R&D for the performance we did at University of Bedfordshire. So it's been um, a quite a long journey 
a quite a long road and quite a lot of conversations and quite a lot of reading because I had to read Alex's book, which is brilliant, uh, three, quite a few times. Because not only do um, I have to dance in the performance, I also have to choreograph as well. So it's really essential that, you know, you, you know what you're trying to do, what you're trying to portray to the audience and also just to um, um, just try to get the essence of the story, which is sometimes can be difficult and other times it can be easy, but just try to get the essence of the story to, to the audience. And Steve, you're in charge of, uh, of the music. Talk about uh, putting this thing together musically. Yes, okay. Um, I mean, I was gonna say, I was gonna pick up on, on what Michael said there about um, you know, him, him coming into the production and being asked to be a, a part of it. And I think a key thing to say is that it was a real team effort here. Mm. And, you know, all of the people that were chosen to be uh, uh, in this cast, either as choreographers or dancers and the musicians as well, it was a vital thing to co connect and, and select the right people. I think, I think the magic of the performance last Friday is a testament to the kind of uh, the relationship and the mutual respect that exists between the people on the production. You know, so Michael uh, was chosen to choreograph <clears throat> two scenes um, that were that were the work scene and the warriors scene, which is the one where the 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 the, the, um, the, the, the slaves transform into warriors through training, and then they go and they actually conduct the uprising in that scene. So, um, I mean, Michael could probably tell you more about that. But coming to the music, excuse me, the music became, um, because we did the music before we did the um, dance on this occasion, and that's because of time restraints, you know, it'd be great to have six weeks and have the musicians in the in the studio with the, with the dancers and create things all together. Because we had to make the music in advance, what we've done with the music and the three of us, that's uh, Kenrick Rowe, myself and Alan Weeks. Um, we've created a kind of structure using the music. We created a structure in which the dance could sit. And um, part of that is, you know, from reading the text, breaking it down into scenes and then condensing it even great, even further because we started off with 27 scenes when we first read this, the text, you know, 27, 28 scenes. We condensed it down to nine scenes or seven scenes, seven, eight, nine scenes. And we had to leave a lot of stuff out, but then we created a piece of music for each of those scenes. That's that's how it started. So we knew what had to happen in those scenes and we knew there was a certain pace. We could We set a pace for those scenes or a tempo for those scenes we knew that there was a emotional factors in those scenes that had to be covered um for example the first scene it was a celebration so we looked at dreamland you know the the, the vision of africa that the slaves were having and we looked at that we knew we had a celebration there but then you you have another scene for example which has lots of movements in it like taki's scene we know that we've got to present his character so we're finding a piece of music that helps us know what this character is, and then also we know that the bat uh, there's a final battle that takes place in that in that scene as well. So how do we um, combine the music with the sound of a battle? So if you like, the music becomes a framework and a structure for for the choreographers to bounce off and to to work with. Yeah, so, uh, were you focusing on a particular kind of music relevant to Africa, or you you just basically let the let the the narrative dictate the type of music you were composing? So, um, Kenrick Rowe brought two pieces of music to the table. They were the two um, um, up tempo drumming pieces, and he was looking at West African drumming. That's his um, his vision for that because he wanted first to describe the character of Taki with a with a with a quick warrior-like drum sequence in the end we used that for the warrior scene um, not tacky's scene and we and then another piece he created for miss pam but we used that for the dreamland so there's two pieces of west african drumming you know um which contain a lot of in fact a lot of those drums in there are played on the keyboard it sounds very natural but we the samples and then uh, alan weeks brought to the table a piece of um um what you might call 
it's something like almost like reggaeton or, or um dance hall so it's it's a dance hall rhythm and we use that in the it was quickly slotted into the work rhythm work work dance because he was using sounds in there that sounded like snare drums they already sounded like whips cracking because he was he was thinking about that before he even came and so for my set and he also made another one which is a high life piece but we didn't use it yet it might appear in the second incarnation of this tune it's like it's like it's another celebratory dance but very caribbean it's very it's like west african high life mixed with uh, mental uh, rhythm and then the pieces that i brought to the table for example i bought the ship uh, music which is loose it's like based on a on an english hymn and it's a kind of irony irony in, in that so a christian like, a, like an amazing grace kind of feeling and then it goes from major to minor. So it takes you into a more melancholy place. And, and the other piece I bought was the the piano piece that builds when um, Taki and the others, they, well, they, Taki's dead, but the others are committing suicide. So we had to find a piece of music that worked for, for a scene as grave as that. Um, then the other three, the other pieces, Taki's music, we, we 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 created it as a group, so there are there are three or four there that we did as as, as a like the fin, um, Taki's music. Um, yeah, I bought Miss Pam's music as well, the reggae. So it's it's all culturally specific, but it's not like music from 1760. It's it's music from now, yeah. you know, because you now we're talking to an, a modern audience. Mm. Michael, how did the um, the music? inform the choreography because i would imagine not being a choreographer myself that that's kind of back to front isn't it um uh, not necessarily i mean sometimes you can work with the music before or after i mean i mean once i knew i was going to be one of the choreographers i had to research some movements myself which means i just go into a studio uh, but the good thing was that steve gave us the music in an early early um um early on in, in its first form, then every time he would update it, and then we would, um, um, well, I would just listen to it. So uh, the music is really important. And so because you've got the music, then it's easier to have like a framework to work from. And like Steve said, I worked on two scenes, which is the Warriors, and then also the work. So um, each uh, are different, um, uh, different scenes within the book and also talking about the other choreographers, I think what um, State of Trust is really good at is getting the, a good team together. So each has, has their strengths, which we used on the piece. But going back to the music, yes, yeah, so the music, I think um, um, sometimes it's, once you have a set of, of, of bars or counts of eight, it's actually easier to choreograph because you know what's going to come in. And like uh, Steve was talking about that high, like a whip. So that was, quite integral in, in one of my sections because you could actually hear the whip and then we just uh, use that as a way to accentuate ourselves uh, being whipped um, by the um, overseers. Um, so yeah, definitely, I mean, I'm loving these pictures, they're great. Um, definitely, um, you can work either way. So you can work before the music or you can work after, but I think it's a good marriage because there's times, you know, myself, Bahrain and Nos, we can talk to Steve and say, could you shorten this bit? Could you lengthen this bit or, or change the music? Um, because we're in the process of research and development, that can be done. The story you covers... Sorry, you asked, me, you asked me to cut the... Because um, there were two... There's two... Up, you know, there's an uprising mm. that's in the warrior scene and the sound of the uprising is actually a, it's a prison wire. That's one of those sound effect libraries, but it sounded right because there you can hear people crying out, oh, being hit and punched, and 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 you asked me just one day, oh, can we have that cut in half? It's like okay, no, we just snip that in half. You know, was, the riot was, you know, the, the uprising was going on too long, so we, yeah. we didn't need it to go on so long. So it could be cut directly in half, and then it still had the same effect. That was great, you know, because we were thinking on our feet, weren't we, Michael? You know, yeah. That day, that day was a testing day because, and that's an, another interesting thing. The sequence of events was interesting. 
Because was there they, anything in the uh sorry Steve is was there anything in the uh, the r and d that was a surprise to you during the r and d that, that that surprised you that felt well I hadn't thought in that direction or we definitely need to change that or yeah there were there were, there were I would, yeah because I mean there was one particular scene that uh, I was finding a bit difficult and then Steve was just giving me information and um reading um passages from Alex's book. And so he was constantly doing that and then feeding information. And then there's one point when I had a, like a sticky moment and I just couldn't get what Steve wanted. So everyone went off to lunch and then I stayed in, in, in the theater and then just um, really tried to in, in, in embellish and try to bring out what Steve wanted. So that then um, came about with the section, which I was really happy that came. But then it, it, that sometimes that's the pressure of the job and that's what you get paid for. Sometimes you just have to knuckle down and just do it, even though you might not be in the right headspace, but there's, there's something that you do as a professional, you just have to dig it out of you. And then something comes out of that. And that is theater. It was, it was, it, that scene, that is the um, the work scene. It turned yeah. out to be a very, very, very great scene. And yeah. and what started as what we might call our kind of, kind of um, drama improvisation, in between the work sections and because uh -huh. Michael bought um you know with him some choreography that he'd worked out in advance but then the difficulty was getting the elements of the story in as well as the movement so what happened was that all everybody started improvising within the scene what's happening you know somebody's going to try and escape they've got to get they've got to have they've got to have fear this is these are the words that we started talking about. Mm -hmm. They've got to have fear, but we've got to have inner rage. Yeah, yeah, and and they they've got to have um, pain. So so that once once they started improvising the bits of the story they got to do, then they put those words into the mix, because everybody in that group, they know how to dig in, dig deep and find those things, because we knew that those you know coming to a group like this. You, you know that those artists can find those emotions, but it was great on that day how it started just as a yeah, kind yeah. of low level drama game. <laughs> but by the end of the day, it ramped up. Yeah. And so, so it wasn't, it wasn't, Michael, it wasn't dictatorial at all. Alex you, you... is asking something. He's muted. No. Sorry to no. bite you in there. I think Alex, Alex, your microphone's off. Yeah, it wasn't Victoria's because I think because um, it was a group of artists all working together. And I think the most important thing was the communication between everybody, you know, with, with Deborah, with Steve, all the artists were always talking about each other. And also we had a uh, an apprentice as well, who's a student from the University of Bedfordshire who I teach as well. So it's good to bring him in and to see how professionals work because um, even he had to up his game as well. And a lot of the uh, tutors at the University of Bedfordshire said, that you know you couldn't tell that he was a student you know because he, he worked in that environment for such a long time that he kind of like you know dug, dug deep he had to dig deep as well to, to you know to get up to the level of the of the other professionals yeah who were the dancers and how many of them were there uh dancers or dancers yeah is it seven seven dancers yeah seven seven dancers yeah or all, all professionals aside from the one student. Yeah, that's correct. Mm -hmm. Alex, the, 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 the story covers, you know, an immense canvas. Uh, how did you home in on what was important to cover and mm, interpret in the in the production? That directed to me. Yes, yes. Oh, sorry. Um, um... I just wanted to concentrate on the skeleton of the story. I mean, the narrative force of the story is just compelling. It, it really is about, um, because I did research on Chief Taki himself, but um, there were some contradictions, whether he was a prince, whether he was stolen from West Africa, taken to the Caribbean. In some, in some documents, I even learned that he was a king. So... Uh, it was all very contradictory, so that's why I decided to, um, okay, in Cane Warriors itself, I decided to make the central character a young teenager and tell the story through his eyes rather than Taki's eyes. 
But um, what I discovered during the, uh, the dance performance, something that really delighted me is that um, the dancers became actors and they wanted to tell their narrative just like I did writing a, writing a story on paper. And that is the important thing because um, this is why I believe this project can travel because um, not everybody can understand English, not everyone can understand um, translation and so on, but through a dance performance, especially if you've got such skilled dancers, you can actually act out the scenes and show the rage, show the pain that Steve was talking about, show the emotions, and then your story becomes universal. Everyone can understand it. And I was watching around the audience and I'm, I was saying to myself, wow, this is, this is amazing. Everyone gets this. I mean, even if um, you came from a different planet and you kind of landed at Bedford University and you sat in the audience, you would have a great idea of what's going on by the interpretation of dance that the dancers um, displayed. And this is why it's so powerful. It's a universal voice. It really is. It's an emotional voice. And I saw those expressions that married with the dance performances and the movement and the physicality. And so I was delighted by that. I really was. I went home feeling wonderful. I really did. Thinking of um, the potential of it. Yeah, I, I say, Alex, um, that's it's really heartwarming to hear. And um, I think if an alien came into the theatre, they'd also realise just how messed up the human race is, you know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because that story tells you, you know, there's, you know, there's, it's terrible that anyone should be in that situation, isn't it? To be yes, it is, and um, in that way, you know. I, I think we spoke briefly after after the performance and. Uh, we're discussing how bad the human race can be. I mean, just topical news is what's happening in Gaza, Israel, the killings on both sides and how low are the depths of um, human behavior can go to. And for me, this is on the same level. It really is. It shows the depravity of the human condition, but also the bravery and the courage and the fortitude as well. It shows all those elements. And again, as I said, that we can show that in dance and expression and physicality, then you're going to communicate with a lot more than what people might think. I think you communicate with everybody because everyone understands that language. Because every culture has gone through it at some point in their in their history. Yeah. What do you feel with the challenges of um, portraying this, you know, pretty weighty story? Yeah. through dance and music. Okay, who's that for? Uh, anybody who wants to answer, but Ma Michael. Me. Um, it is a challenge because um, like Steve said earlier, you know, there was like 27 scenes and then you got whittled down to nine scenes, nine to seven scenes. So you have in your head, um, Alex's vision of what it should be. And then you have your choreographer's head. You also have your dancer's head as well. So. It's all these things happening, and um, it, you just you just realize that you have to you have to you know be truthful to the story as much as you can, and 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 just go to your 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 deepest darkest place to bring out those emotions, those raw emotions. Because I think a lot of people said about the performance that it was really raw raw emotions, and that a few people said they were crying as well because it was um that that um. um that intense and that's you know the characters being that strong um so it's a challenge because you know you've got you know uh, nine days to get it together it's a challenge because you've got to get the music right it's a challenge because you um you may have a few injuries with the dancers it's a challenge because um, um you keep on changing spaces within the university so all these things you've got to take on board but um if, if you're a professional then you just take those things on board and then just you know move forward and then move forward as a whole team as well. And I keep on saying this, but you know, most important thing is the communication between the whole team because everybody had a voice. Um, it, even when I was choreographing, people say, you know, maybe try this or or let's try this. And you know, it's not like, oh, I'm, I'm precious, I've got to, you know, I don't want to do that. It's about being open. And I think everyone was open 
and everyone when, um, was contributing because it's such a short time to get a piece together of, you know, it's an hour show. So to get that in nine days is yeah. quite cool. And the other thing about it being a short time and a short show is what we had to leave out of yeah. the novel from the novel as well. And it's some significant parts of the novel had to be, we had to make a choice what part of the novel we're going to really focus on. And we did focus on uh, the fighting really part, you know, and also Miss Pam's character. Mm -hmm. And although she's not, uh, she doesn't, she only appears in the, in the novel as something, somebody that's being talked about. We, we wanted to fill in her story and real, realize her presence. So, what we left out though is is the story of the women in general you know that in the second link you know when we get more money to do this further we're going to weave in the story of the women you know little hopi hamaya mama uh, miss gloria and and was it manelwa and that 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 section where the, the, he meets those women in, in the trinity plantation because mm -hmm. it seems to me that moa's character needs to be he's only half his character is there in this in our version now him with the men and so we need to build him with the women because that's very important for how he is and who he is and that i think when you come to that second version moa will come into himself because at the moment he's his party you know taki is probably the main character taki and miss pam are the main characters in this version i think so it's what we left out that was a difficulty and Alex, did you play a role in what was left in and what was taken out? No, no. Um, but I decided let Steve and the musicians and the choreographers um, address that. But I was pleasantly surprised. I mean, um, I was um, sent me all the email, said we're at this stage, we're at that stage and so on. But um, I, I prefer to um, leave the, uh, the creatives in terms of dance to um, just produce what they felt they needed to produce. I didn't want to be um, a shudder over their shoulder or something, you know, that's, that's not me. Uh, because uh, everybody's inter interpretation will be different to mine. And to be honest, I think it was uh, refreshing to see um, new eyes uh, see this story and take it forward, rather than me saying, you know, being dogmatic, dogmatic about it. So, oh, you have to do this, you have to do that. You know, I would have just got in a way, to be honest. So, but uh, again, I was just, uh, pleasantly surprised and I loved it. It's funny you say that actually, because I once interviewed Stephen King about one of his books and asked him about, um, you know, when it was turned into film, what he thought and did he have any input or whatever. And he said, look, once I've written the book, they have bought it. What they do with it is up to them. The book's my business. The film's their business. So <laughs> maybe it's a thread that runs through all, all authors. <laughs> <laughs> Not all authors, but um, I think, yeah, we, can't, we cannot be too precious about um, what's written in stone. You know, um, it's up to others to interpret what, how they perceive that story to be and how they want to tell that story in dance form. I mean, I'm not a cho choreographer, you know, I'm, I, that's not me. So, uh, I mean, if it was a play or a movie, then yes, maybe I would have um, looked over the shoulders a bit more. But as a dance performance, I thought, okay. Let them, um, you know, let's let's enjoy this. You know, I can just sit back, relax, and um, come to uh, any performance and enjoy it. So that's what I did. Well, we're, we're very relieved that you liked it. You know, <laughs> yeah. it's important. You know, it's, yeah, we crossed that. Was bridge. it ever was it ever considered to have an, an, a narrator to sort of intersperse or move the action along to tell the story more more fully? I think what we what we're discussing or thinking about now is like like a chorus, like a singing, or a narrator through singing. Because I think there's a there's a there's a similarity. This is this is a tragedy, you know, that is the type of drama that it is. And I studied English, so I, you know, I did a bit of that when I was in university. It is a tragedy, like a Shakespearean tragedy. It has a it has certain moral um, themes that go through it it has a disaster and it has a lot of people dead in it and it's like a greek tragedy as well and in the, one of the, the ways that the greek tragedies worked was with singing choruses or speaking choruses they used to have a group of people to stop the action and there'd be some kind of song 
and there is a song in Cane Warriors which is um, no no worry children. So that's a, that, that's something that could be used, and, and you could use and you could use a function of singers either in person or recorded to give more information. Oh, I, I like the sound of that, Steve. I mean, maybe I could be um, Bernie talking to someone's Elton John. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's a serious subject. Um, obviously, you want to inform, but you've also got a duty to entertain. Um, Michael, how did you sort of marry the two ideas? Um, so we definitely spoke about this and we, we didn't really actually want to entertain at all. We wanted people to think about what they've just seen and to question what they've seen as well. So in terms of the, the, the choreography, we did some, um, it definitely wasn't entertaining. In some aspects it was, but we didn't aim out, we didn't set out to be, ent you know, entertain the audience. We went out there to educate the audience. So that's, that's, a, that's really important. And so once we knew that in our heads, we knew what we had to do with the choreography. And again, like I said, just having to, you know, dig deep and really find those nuances and find those particular things that um, will resonate with the audience. Hmm. Yeah, Bahrain says that. He says it's not entertainment. Hmm. Well, the choreographer Bahrain, who played Taki. He says it's not entertainment. It's knowledge. Yeah, I guess that's true to a certain extent. But when you think about it, um, if you watch films like 300, uh, with the Spartans and so on, against the um, the masses of, uh, what's the army? I cannot remember. Yeah. Um, is that entertainment? Is is that drama? What is it? Um, and when and when you talk about Troy or any other major world events, wars and so on, um, for me, the narrative, um, like I read, I, I remember reading many years ago the um, the Iliad about the return of um, well the whole Troy story and the return of Odysseus and so on to the Greek islands and so on. Um, that taught me, but also entertained me. And I, I believe that Kane Warriors, yes, it, of course it's an educational tool, but it can entertain as well because the drama compels you to be entertained. You cannot help but um, engage with the characters. You want to know if Tack is going to live. You want to know if Moa is going to live. Once you have an audience um, asking those questions, you are entertaining them because you are engaging them with the narrative. So um, very much so that is, uh, I believe that um, people will go away. Some will think, oh yeah, that was great to learn. I didn't know this subject matter. And some will go away uh, th thinking about it for a long time. And some will say, oh, that was an entertaining evening. For hmm. surely uh, entertainment makes it accessible and um, by which you can then- Absolutely. You know, put, put, uh, portray your message. I would imagine you can reach people, can't you? You mm. want to reach as many people as possible, don't yeah. you? Yeah, absolutely. And I, guess the, and I guess the entertainment part would be, um, I guess, you know, seeing dancers move in the space, listening to the music as well. Also, there's lights, there's costumes, there's, there's all those levels which kind of like add to the um, entertainment part. I'm finding it hard to to say the word entertain because for me, it's I think it's difficult. Yeah. I think it's difficult. Different, different people. I think it's particularly difficult for the dancers because mm. they have to be these characters, you know, they have to yeah. transform. They they virtually live, the char they become the character, so it's painful. You mentioned costumes there. Is it, I mean, it's, it's, it's not really a costume piece though, is it? Um, I think sometimes when you see uh, anything on stage, on TV on or on films, um, there's always has to be a budget for costumes just so you can uh, realize the story and just add to the story as well because we couldn't really be in suits um, so uh, we just had really simple costumes and then um, bare top as well at one point as well because we've been transferred from the ship uh, to the workland so um, uh, yeah I think a costume is always, is always a consideration because it, you, you need that um, to unify the piece in, in a certain sense and not just to set the scene and also you know the year it's set in as well so it's not costumes that are 
like suits and ties and, and lab braces or something that's quite simple but you can see the shape of the body and you can see the shape of the dancers moving in space as well did you ever consider modern costumes as opposed to making it a period piece again to make it more accessible mm. because the music is contemporary yeah as steve said the music's contemporary yeah what comes to mind in in my head is it might sound off the wall, but Jesus Christ Superstar, right? When when yeah. Jesus Christ Superstar came out, which is what, 1971 or something, it starts with a sequence of a lot of young people like hippies arriving in the Holy Land, in the desert. Yeah, and they, they got a bus and they set up their theatre, you know, and they are definitely actors. And then they set up their thing and then it all begins and it kicks off and they then you go into the story. And at the end of it, I think they close up shop as well. So they, they, they're very conscious of themselves as actors yeah and the costumes they wore were like hippies from the 60s but they were telling the story of jesus in, in 2000 you know one whatever it was 30 ad so that's a nice um comparison you know we are players we are a team of players aren't we you know we yeah theater and we create our illusion yeah and also the, the costumes is almost like the last layer of your character um uh in in the dance um because you know you, you have the dance you have the music and you have the characterization and then you have the costume that goes on top and then of course uh makeup as well for when we uh had right. um the wall paint on us um so all those layers just add, add to the piece yeah um but the costumes are also have to be functional as well which what i what i mean by that is they have to we have to be able to move and some things were changed because like I think with the uh, with Nos and Deborah, they had to split the side of the skirt because it was a bit too restricted, uh, restrictive. So you know these kind of things you do through dress rehearsals and and um, just trying out the costume to see how it works. And also because of costume change, you have to know where your costumes are. So there's a, there's a lot of things to consider um, when performing. Alex, how did what you saw, because obviously this is just an extract of what, what the final yeah. production would be, how did that tally with what was in your head? When you it tallied very much, it tallied very much with what is inside my head, because um, I write with emotion. And um, this story has been marinating inside my head for quite a while. And so I'm, you know, sometimes as a creative, I'm not sure if other writers work this way. I close my eyes and I try to imagine the characters inside my head, the way they move, the way they walk, the way they um, show love for each other, the way they show anger towards each other. Um, because uh, there is an um, a aspect of the book where Moa's father, he actually disapproves of the uprising. So there's a lot of anger there. There's a lot of self-doubt. And so all these questions were marinating inside of my head. And, you know, as a creative, I'm trying to imagine what would the expressions be? What would a movement be? How would they uh, navigate all these um, arguments and uh, to and fro and um, the debate and uh, the anger about the masters and so forth? And so before I even write a paragraph, I'm considering um, the major characters in terms of movement. And so to see that realized at Bedford last Friday was just amazing. It's like, oh, okay, they they totally understand what I'm, you know, what my vision is. Because that is how I start a story. I have to have some kind of vision first. I have to see the characters first. I have to imagine them first. Uh, you know, I, I, I know some writers, they can just say, um, oh, I'm going to start another story tomorrow and off they go. But I can't do that. I've got to at least marinate it inside my head, think about it, and um, see them, you know, in my imagination, see them move and see them physically, see their faces, you know, see their build, their physique. And so it, it's perfect. It's perfect for a writer like me to see that um, performance, because now I've got even other ideas now. I might even write a backstory about Miss Pam now. Mm. Uh, the way uh, Deborah performed her. So uh, just giving me ideas on top of ideas. You know, um, there's a story for, for, for Steve and uh, a question for Steve and Michael. How much pressure did you feel to realize 
Alex's vision, both in the book and in terms of what was in his head? Yeah, I mean, some, I was just going to say that, you know, he was talking about the, the fight with Papa when, when Papa disapproves and there's a fight. Well, that, you know, that was beautiful for that scene because you'd really written, you'd actually choreographed that scene. You know, you you said that he got his around his neck. He said his eyes were popping out. He was down on the floor. You know, a lot of those movements appeared there, didn't they? I mean, we the difficulty for us sometimes was we only had seven people, you know, and so we it was it Papa, we had to have people we didn't really want our people to do multiple characters. We wanted people to embody a character, but sometimes they had to merge or switch. Those were difficulties. But sometimes in the book you you know, when we first read it, you describe something that seems to be a dance. You know, I can think of one that said here, the broad waters held his gaze as if he was expecting the duppies of our lost brothers and sisters to rise out of it. You know, the minute we read that, we said to dance. You know, it's only a throw, it's only one sentence, mm. but it's a dance. And so sometimes some a little piece in the, in what you've written has amplified itself into something major inside the, the dance. And I suppose it's just a different way because there's no dialogue, is there? You know, all those words are shh, <laughs> condensed into movement. Uh, to add to that, um, um, yeah, there was a lot of pressure because, you know, like I said, you needed to realise um, Alex's um, book. And also reading the book is really descriptive as well, really descriptive. So there's lots of things that you think about when you read it yourself and then you just know you have to try to get that across to the audience. Because sometimes within a company, you, you can try things out and it works with, with the company itself. But you, then you have to realise that the audience have to understand as well. So it's just trying to bridge that gap between the author, the choreographer, the dancers and the audience just to make sure that it all comes together. So, yeah, a lot of pressure because it was nine days as well. So you just got to, you know, pick a good team. We had a good team and then just go for it. Why was it? Why was there so much? Why did you put yourself under so much time pressure? How did that work out? <laughs> the finance. Finance. Yeah. yeah. OK. Enough said. <laughs> um, but, yeah, to create a show in seven days, I think it's a record for us. Although we did work on something you know, in Bristol with Edson Burton, and he did a show in four days, I think it was. A full mm -hmm. pantomime. <laughs> but seven days for us is a record, I think. Hmm. I, I mean, ultimately, the, 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 uh, the production is going to be across choreography and music, as we said. I see photography and film, and then the book itself. Why did you want to paint on such a broad canvas? Maybe that's one for Alex. Why not? Why not? Um, our stories are as important as anybody else's. Why not um, decide on a broad canvas to tell this story? That's what it deserves. That's how I imagined it. So um, indeed, why not? You know, um, Romeo and Juliet is told in every... Uh, question of art form there is. Why can't our stories be told in that way, even if they're historical? You know, so um, I'm not one to think, oh, um, there's a ceiling to this. No, no way. I, I don't see any ceiling to this whatsoever. It's, um, it's storytelling of the highest merit, I believe. And it's not really me telling the story. I just found the story. You know, it's always been there. It's just that we've been unaware of the power of this story and it deserves any platform that it can reach. Whether it's China, whether it's South Africa, whether it's the Caribbean, let it reach there, you know, and it dances the medium to take it there, so be it, you know, so I don't see no boundaries to this. How much do you think that this this production and others like it will raise awareness of Britain's role in the, in the slave trade. Well, how much do you hope it does? Michael, if you'd like to answer. Um, I think um, it will bring forward talks and discussions because, I mean, part of this uh, project was also teaching workshops in schools. So I did quite a few of those. And... Um, um, 
what the, the the process of the workshop i guess is that um, um alex would either either go in in person or or have a video that they would um watch and listen to and then they would maybe read some passages from the books and then we'd go in the be a musician and and also a dancer and so that's a way of, of, of also um, um getting them to understand the complexity and the brutality of you know that era of of slavery and it's you know sometimes you know some people don't realize that history and it's just important that that's still talk talked about and still you know um discussed and mm -hmm. yes so it's it a lot of, um those workshops really helps because it just got the um especially at the evaluation at the end you got the the, the students to understand what people went through to to get to that place yeah, and you hope that the emotional experience in the theatre, you hope that people, well, you, 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 I think they do. Once they feel that emotion, then they, they kind of start to question it. So they need time to process it. What is happening here? We've got two questions as well, by the way. Sorry? We've got two questions. One from oh, Jack yeah. and one from Deborah. Well, I was going to move on to the Q&A now. I mean, one okay. of them is was... Uh, uh, it, was it emotional for the dancers practicing the performance? And if so, how did they manage their, their emotions? Yeah, it's very emotional because um, like Steve said, we had to um, think about the characters and then, you know, dig something from us, the, the emotions of what happened in, in that particular time. And that's quite exhausting as well because, you know, the audience just sees the performance, but they don't see everything that leads up towards that. So there's, you know, many days of rehearsals of trying to get scenes, you know, just going over and over discussion. And um, what was really good was that um, every evening um, it was videoed and then Steve would upload it. And then we can actually look to see what we did. And then from there, we can move forward to the next day because having all that information ready and waiting for us, we, we, we can improve on our performance. We, we can also work on things that didn't work so well. Another audience question, what's the vision for the next phase of the project? Okay. Steve? More, more, more funding so we can get the whole thing into a, um, into a theater, perhaps as a, as a residency or, you know, we're, we're looking at three, three cities really. We, we, we perf we'd like to do it in three cities, London, Bristol and Liverpool. So, you know, the big slave port cities. That seems to be relevant, you know, and um, but, but residences is what we need. We need more than one night shows. We need um, a run. I mean, you touched on it before, but where, where will you take the story beyond where it is now? Oh, yes. Well, we have to weave in the story of Moa and the women characters. It's like the two things will weave together and and, and fulfill the full, the, the full vision of the novel. And another thing that we've got is set. Oh yes, yeah. yeah. We have, a, we have, a, we have a, a great set which we're building um, for, for Bristol. Oh, yeah. which will be seen in the in the one of the productions in March. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Do you plan to? Is another question. Do you plan to revisit and perform at Beckford's Tower again? Yep. 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 Yeah, we do have. We have a. a performance in Beckford Tower on the 22nd of March and it'll be some kind of adapted performance specifically for that space with a very small space but it's it's, all, it's also that's another thing it's not a theatre it's a monument you know, it's a monument built by William Beckford and and he you know William Beckford was the owner of the plantations on Jamaica so it's Again, is this entertainment? This, this the event in in Beckford Tower is not entertainment. It's a visitation and a kind of experience. Okay, it's a very powerful um, experience um, about claiming that tower, taking that tower. What do you hope the uh, the legacy of this Kane Warriors production will be? Maybe, um, Alex, you could elaborate. For me, it's quite simple, this a greater awareness of our story. Um, that children in schools up and down the country 
can study this part of the history. And I know people say, oh no, not slavery again, not slavery again. But when you um, engage them with the physicality and the emotion of it, I mean, there's a lot of emotion in cane warriors with um, parents uh, separated from their children and so on. You know, these are universal themes that we, we, we've we been seeing replayed up to the modern day. And so I just want young people to recognize that, okay, it's not just about slaves getting whipped on the back, you know, as they're cutting cane. It's a whole dynamic of how those families lived and how they interacted with each other and how they survived that um, terrible time. And I know, um, you know, even some of my friends say, oh, Alex, this is, you know, I can't read this or, I, uh, you know, um, some friends say, oh, I can't even watch Steve McQueen's 12 Years a Slave and so forth. But it's the, um, it's the interactions of the characters. It's how they deal with the situation that is confronting them. It's the drama of it all. Because I learned a great deal more when I was actually engaging the story and the drama than I did from ever learning a cold textbook. And that's the advantage of any kind of performance, whether it's dance, acting, the stage, film, or whatever. That's the advantage it has. It pulls you in. It pulls you in because you become invested in the characters laid in front of you. And especially if you see a live performance, you become even more invested, just like I was on Friday night. You know, it, it, so I enjoyed it just as a um, just as a spectator. You know, I was I wasn't a writer anymore. I'm just enjoying this as a performance of storytelling of these people that um, you know try to achieve what they did. And I, I want young people to have that experience with my work and others. You know, so. Um, and it should be. We should not be ashamed or shouting out to the heavens that this is an interesting story, just like, as I mentioned before, the 300 and Achilles and Troy and Hector and everybody else, all those great heroes that we learn about um, in history, if you uh, follow the English curriculum. This is up there with the best. So I want people to recognise that and understand that and, um, you know, reshape the canon, as it were. And now is the right time. Why? Well, there's um, there's discussions now about reparations. There's forums about it in the Caribbean. Just the other day, um, the Grenadian uh, Prime Minister stood up in the um, United Nations and he made a very articulate speech about reparations. Prince Charles went to Barbados, what, what, when was it, last year? And he actually apologised, something that no Prime Minister has ever done, about slavery. And so it's an active topical uh, debate that um, this country will have to face, even though the likes of, uh, you know, uh, some interviewers who are, were not named uh, are very abusive. You know, there's one interviewer who slammed his fist on the table when the great prime minister actually um, spoke about reparations. It's like he's not allowed to, um, he's not allowed to address that. It should be uh, remaining as it is, but no, there's lots of questions to be asked. And it's not about um, it's not about giving every descendant of slaves twenty dollars in their pocket. It's something you know we could talk about trade tariffs and the rest of it. You know, I'm not a financial whiz kid, but um, the debate is there to be had. And if performances like Kane Warriors provoke that debate, then so be it. Well, it certainly seems like he captured the mood of the moment in the UK for sure. Um, okay, guys. Um, that's the end of our webinar series. Uh, as Steve alluded to, you can catch the first production of Cane Warriors on March 22nd next year at Beckford's Tower. And then again, the following day, Saturday, March 23rd at the Arnolfini Gallery and Art Centre in Bristol. But for now, that's our time. Thanks to uh, all three of you for a very interesting and enlightening discussion. I'm Terry Badu. Thanks very much for watching. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.